Welcome back, ladies. It's been a month, hasn't it? In this life, you will have suffering, but with Christ, you can find the beauty. Do you have pain? Do you need more peace? Then the answer is discipleship. And it's not that hard. It's easier than you think. Take this journey with me. My name is Tara Hannon from Blooms and Benedictions, where we walk with Christ to find the roses among the thorns. Show up every week and watch how your spirit will grow. You were born to bloom. This week, we're diving back into the life of Ruth, the Moabite, and Boaz, her kinsman redeemer. And we're gonna find out what does her life have to teach us? What are the secrets that we need to know from her journey that can help us in our modern day life? So we're picking up the story where she's headed to the threshing floor. She's taking the advice of her mentor, Naomi, who is sending her to have this midnight encounter with Boaz. And I'm kind of on the edge of my seat, like, is this gonna be shady? Is this gonna be questionable? Or will they be honorable in their conduct? So let's turn to the word and find out. Okay, so if you aren't caught up, go to last week's video and watch what's going on with Ruth. She is a Moabite woman who is in a different culture. She's considered a heathen. She would be an outcast. She would be a reject. She's lost her husband, so she's a widow, but she's done one correct thing, which is follow the woman of God, Naomi, to a new life and destiny. And Naomi is looking for a kinsman redeemer for Ruth. And so Ruth has been hanging out in the fields of this guy, Boaz. Now Boaz is an old hot dude, okay? His name means fleet footed or strong. So he's older, but he's strong. And he's been taking notice of her and he's been finding that she's an honorable lady. So now we're gonna see in chapter three, what's gonna go down at the threshing floor. The threshing floor would have been symbolic in the Bible for a place of judgment. Um, it's a place where they would separate the wheat from the chaff. And so they would shake out all the good parts of the harvest from all the bad, all the stuff that needs to fly away, flutter away. And so it's almost symbolic to say um, this, this place of judgment for Ruth and Boaz, are they going to do a sexually impure thing here? Or are they going to honor God and get into right relationship and become uh, engaged, if you will, in this kinsman redeemer situation? So let's pick it up in chapter three, verse six. Okay, so she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Okay. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant for you are a redeemer. Okay. So there's some things that you should be noticing as the reader that the original reader might have picked up on. There is a sexual innuendo going on here referring to feet. That can also be an innuendo for man parts. So yeah, the Bible's exciting. You gotta get into it. Okay, so you're meant to think, oh my gosh, are they going to basically enter into an illicit relationship here in the darkness, like under cloak. She says, spread your cloak over me. Does that mean like get under the covers with me? Or does that mean shelter me, protect me, provide a future for me? She's basically offering herself to him in marriage and saying, I choose you. I find you the man that I want to walk through life with. Do you find me desirable? Do you find me honorable? Okay, so he says in verse 10, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. Remember, he's like an older dude. He's getting up there in years, but he's still really healthy and of course handsome because duh, he's Boaz. Okay. So we don't really know that, but we can assume that, right? 
it makes the story better. But we definitely know that he is wealthy. He owns the fields that she has been gleaning in. And he says, and now my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. Her reputation precedes her, ladies. That is what we need in life. Amen. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. And yet, ugh, there is a redeemer nearer than I. Oh no, is it not going to work out? Are they not going to get together? It's possible. But he says, remain tonight. And in the morning, if he will redeem you, good. Let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, he's like making a vow, he's making a declaration, I will redeem you, lie down until morning. Okay, so they wouldn't necessarily have been totally alone. He would have been there with his other field workers. And so the story goes that she rests through the night, she leaves early in the morning so that nobody notices her, and she waits to hear the report of what Boaz is going to go find out. And he's going to go up to the town square, which is basically like a place of meeting where important men would come and they would sit and they would hold counsel. Well, it just so happened that the kinsman redeemer that's closer in line to basically give Ruth the child that she deserved through the lineage of Malon who died. That was her husband and she was left childless. That redeemer comes by to the city center and Boaz is like, hey buddy, come over here, sit down. He's already in a place of esteem. He's already like holding counsel and sitting there and he's inviting this man in. He could have kept this a secret from him. He could have said, man, this is the lady I love. I want to put a ring on it. I don't want to find out honorably if there's anyone who's going to come before me. But he doesn't do that. He gives the man the right and proper opportunity to take advantage of his kinship. He is the closest in kin. And he says, okay, yeah, I will redeem it. I will buy that field. I will have um, all that wealth and all that prestige that um, Elimelech left behind. That's Naomi's husband when he died. But then he finds out, Ooh, I got to take on this, this lady Ruth, this foreigner, this heathen, and I have to give her a child. Mm, I don't know about all that. And in verse six of chapter four, he says, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. So he basically writes himself out of the lineage of Christ and the will of God. He could have been that kinsman redeemer. It could have been him that we knew his name, but that's it. He fades into the dustbin of history and we don't hear from this guy again. And so now the stage is cleared. Boaz can swoop in and have the love of his life. And he says to the elders in verse nine and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon and Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance so that they may not be cut off from among his brothers. And you are witnesses to this day. And so we see this beautiful story arc of in three months, Ruth's life is totally redeemed. Remember, she had 10 years of fruitlessness. And in just one barley harvest time, the Lord totally redeems. You remember that from Dumb and Dumber? <laughs> totally redeemed. <laughs> this is what happens to Ruth. And her life is totally redeemed. And she found, finds a husband. And he loves her. And he's a man of God. And he's honorable. And they, of course, go on to have a baby. Baby time. I got four babies. They're the best. Every time they enter into your life, it's just the redemption of everything. It's the celebration of your love. And that's what happens for Ruth and Boaz. They have this baby boy and his name is Obed. And he's the father of Jesse, who's the father of King David. And as we know, that's the lineage of Christ. And so Ruth gets wrapped into this beautiful story that is going to usher in our savior. So in a span of three months time, 
we see all the loss, all the heartache, all the fruitlessness, the suffering, the pain that Ruth has endured as a widow and then an outcast, she's poverty stricken, all of it gets wiped clean in this moment of kinsmen redeeming. And we are meant to see that picture of Christ in the Old Testament, that he is our kinsman redeemer. And in an instant, he can wipe away the sorrows of our past and give us a rich legacy. In chapter four, verse 11, it says, then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah. Do you guys remember them? They were Jacob's two wives. There was always a feud between them because Rachel was loved and Leah was unloved. And so we're meant to notice by this reference that Ruth has both the love and the fruitfulness of her marriage, that she is going to be both loved and wanted and also able to have children with her husband. So she will be like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. And so here again, we're supposed to notice a biblical reference that in that story arc, Tamar was owed a kinsman redeemer because her first husband had died. It was Judah's son. He's one of the 12 tribes and he had died and then his next son had died. And so she was owed the third son, but Judah basically withholds that son. And so Tamar tricks him by basically prostituting herself with her father-in-law. Ew, gross, I know, but this is supposed to reveal that this is a redeemed version of that storyline, that that second relative kinsman redeemer narrative, that here it goes honorably and here it goes well. And Boaz and Ruth, they get their married life on and they have their little baby and Naomi is restored in her relationship as a grandmother and as a mentor and as a mother-in-law. And so let's turn and just find out what are these life lessons? What are the things that we can take away from Ruth's story? Okay, life lessons of Ruth. Number one, God honors purity. Simply that, keep your life pure and the Lord will honor you, ladies. Number two, true humility is very rare, but very attractive. Number three, character should be the highest thing on our list. When you're looking for a man, when you're looking for a mate, the muscles, the handsome face, the cool like hair, the swaggy clothes, all that stuff is going to fade. If character is not at the top of your list, you gotta rewrite your list, okay? Number four, don't let your circumstances dictate your confidence. You are always worthy. Ruth found herself totally humbled. She was at the bottom of society, scraping out that field, trying to find a living, earn a living, feed herself and her mother-in-law. And she was totally elevated by doing that hard work and by not feeling like she had her future canceled by her circumstances. She continued to have confidence that she was worthy. Number five, take bold risks as you hope in God. He will not abandon you at the threshing floor. And finally, number six, don't write yourself out of God's epic fairy tale or saga or narrative or adventure or rule book or story or manual or biography or whatever Enneagram number you are, one of those words is gonna resonate with you. But don't write yourself out of God's story that initial kinsman redeemer, he could have been part of this epic story, but we never hear of him again. So don't do that. Get in line with what God has for your life. Remember ladies, you were born to bloom. You just need living water. 
So stick with me on this discipleship journey. We'll be back next week with the life of Bathsheba. Was she good? Was she bad? What does she have to teach us? We're going to find out all the mysteries. Remember to like and subscribe and push the little bell for all the notifications. And I'm so happy to meet with you every week. My name is Tara Hannon from Blooms and Benedictions, and I'll see you next time. God bless.